Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's session of the Berkeley Forum. My name is Aparna Iyer, and I'm the current president of the forum. We're incredibly excited to welcome Catherine Marr here today. To our audience, firstly, we invite you to fill out the attendance form at tinyurl.com slash marrattendance, and to submit questions for our moderator to read aloud at tinyurl.com slash marrquestions. Before we begin, the Berkeley Forum would like to take the time to acknowledge that our events and UC Berkeley's campus sit on the territory of the Ohlone people and that we benefit from the continued occupation of this land. It's important to us to recognize this as the Mwekma Ohlone people are still alive and present within the Bay Area today. For more native education resources, we encourage you to look to the Centers for Educational Justice and Community Engagement. And with that, it's my pleasure to invite up the event manager for the evening, Brian Chi. Tonight, we have the honor of hosting Catherine Marr. Catherine Marr is the CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation, the nonprofit organization that operates Wikipedia and the Wikimedia projects. She is a longtime advocate for free and open societies and has lived and worked around the world leading the introduction of technology and innovation in human rights good governance, and international development. Catherine has worked with UNICEF, the National Democratic Institute, the World Bank, and Access Now on programs supporting technologies for democratic participation, civic engagement, and open government. She is a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Council on Human Rights and the Council on Foreign Relations, and a fellow of the Truman National Security Project. It is now my honor to invite Catherine Marr up to the virtual stage. Thank you, Brian, for that introduction. I'd also like to invite up Oriana Jia, our moderator for the evening, to begin this fireside chat. Hello. Thank you, Catherine, for speaking with us tonight. We're so very excited to have you join us. Oh, it, it's wonderful to be here, Oriana. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to this. Of course. And before I jump into my questions, I just wanna remind everyone in the audience once again that we have a question form pinned in the comments and that we'll be taking a few of these questions submitted at the end. So uh, to begin, I wanna ask you about Wikipedia. Wikipedia has more than 55 million articles in over 300 languages and on every topic imaginable. Given the sheer breadth of information that Wikipedia covers, what role in our digital ecosystem do you think Wikipedia should or does fulfill? Ooh, um, well, it certainly plays a critical role. Before I jump into that, I actually wanted to say, you know, even one of the things that you said around it has articles in every topic imaginable is such an interesting thing for us to explore in the conversation tonight, because it is certainly true that I, Wikipedia has millions of articles. And in some ways it feels like the fulfillment of anything that we could ask about. And yet one of the big things that we advocate for at the Wikimedia Foundation is actually all of the knowledge that is not yet represented. And so I'm really looking forward to talking about that as we go into the conversation. But we, what role do we play? Well, I, I think we play both a visible role and an, unvis an invisible role. And I often think of it a little bit like lurking at the surface of a lake. So when you look at Wikipedia, what you often see first is the articles. And so you're going and you're searching for something, whether it's the population of the city of Berkeley or whether it is learning about the history of the Ohlone people in California. And sometimes there's very superficial ways of looking at information, a data statistic, population, sometimes it's a much deeper learning journey. Um, that's really what the article is there for. And it's the way that most people experience Wikipedia. But behind the scenes, Wikipedia has grown to be so much more for so many aspects of our digital life. So we as individuals read Wikipedia articles, but at the same time that that's happening, there's a rich way in which Wikipedia is actually filling in the sort of epistemic backbone of the web in ways that we might not even see sort of in that in that visual sense. So it's a little bit like we look at the surface of the lake, but actually underneath the lake, there's all this activity happening. It, you know, that activity sits within the streams and the eddies that fill in that lake. It sits within the ecosystem that, um, that relies on that lake, that lives in that lake, that drinks from that lake. Um, 
And what we see with Wikipedia is that we are looking at the surface of this lake when we see the articles, but below there's this rich data ecosystem of how Wikipedia provides a, tax, a taxonomic model for how concepts are constructed and connected. We see the way that Wikipedia provides uh, the the resource for machine learning and computational science exploration for research into questions of sociological questions around how we construct knowledge about the ways in which information is processed, processed and parsed um, in a variety of different formats in the ways that companies use that information on Wikipedia, both the data that sits behind the articles, as well as the models, um, the linguistic models, the sort of conceptual models that Wikipedia articles offer. So Wikipedia is both this, this great resource that we use to you know, do our homework Homework, do research, um, to answer questions while we're watching the news. And it has also really filled out this um, role within the broader digital ecosystem as a source of general purpose knowledge that is repurposed and reused in all sorts of different ways that sort of sit just below the surface of our, our current digital existence. Wow. There is indeed a lot about Wikipedia <laughs> you don't see on the surface. Sorry. <laughs> No, that's genuinely very interesting to hear. Um, I'm curious, are there any particular usages for Wikipedia that you think people um, it, are most unexpected for people to learn about? Well, I think one of the things that I've always found fascinating about Wikipedia is that it tends to be a really personal relationship that people have with the Wikipedia. So the people that we hear from when we ask about how you use Wikipedia tend to be our most passionate users and they um, tend to be folks who have a vested commitment to Wikipedia's existence. So this tends to be like our hardcore readers. It tends to be fans on social media. It tends to be people who are donors. And one of the things that I'm, I'm really struck by in all of these conversations is how personal that usage is. People use Wikipedia in ways to fill in gaps in their education, to be able to um, launch new initiatives in at work or in their own lives, to explore questions that perhaps were um, out of their out of their sort of field of vision in some sort of way, whether that's thinking about questions of human sexuality, thinking of questions of religion, thinking of questions that sort of sit at the margins of what is sort of disc in the public discourse. Wikipedia is this resource that, that folks have that is always there, that's available for them, that, a lot, that doesn't judge their curiosity, um, that enables people to go on this learning journey in a way that is so much more accessible than, you know, a library is. Not that you know, we, we're not in competition with libraries, we love libraries, but in that sort of way that allows you to go through that interlink structure and start with a, perhaps a question about roses and end with a question about sort of contemporary architecture. And, and I think that that is something that is so unique in the way that each of us experience Wikipedia. So um, curiosity, I guess curiosity is the thing that I get most excited about when we think about how people use it today. Thank you for sharing. Um, and I want to pull on something that you you just mentioned, people using Wikipedia as a sort of educational resource. So Wikipedia recently partnered with UNESCO's Global Education Coalition to provide free educational materials during the pandemic. Given the Wikimedia Foundation's commitment to accessible knowledge, is the foundation looking to move towards providing educational curriculum in addition to reference material? It's definitely a question that we've asked ourselves that whether that's the right place for Wikipedia to be. I think that it's still sort of an open question. And I we have this expression at, at Wikimedia, which is like, never say never, because Wikipedia changes all the time. It, it The community grows and has new passions and ideas. And so much of what we're doing today, we weren't doing 10 years ago. But I think in this space of educational resources and curriculum, what we're really looking at right now is how can we work with educators so that they feel most familiar with the resources that they, that we offer so they can craft curricula that's most appropriate for their students and their contexts. We did talk at one point about whether we could be sort of in the not the business, but in the practice of creating curricula that would be free and open, access, openly accessible, sort of along the lines of open educational resources. And, and what we came 
kind of continued to circle back to is every community, every language, every context is going to need something slightly different based on what the priorities are for their students, based on the educational ecosystem that folks are working in, based on the access to other additional resources. And so better for us to work with educators to understand their needs and see how we fill in the gaps on our side in terms of the knowledge that we have as they go about the process of really structuring that intellectual inquiry that they want their students to engage in. So another way that educators have kind of interacted with Wikipedia in the past has perhaps been in a less positive way. I know when I went to high school, my high school teachers told me not to use Wikipedia as a research source. So do you feel that perception has shifted? And if so, why? So I'm going to sound like the oldest study daddy in the world, but like I remember too sitting in my middle school uh, library and being told not to use the encyclopedia as a reference in any of my papers. And so I come to this and go, well, we never were allowed to use encyclopedias as references. They were always meant to be places where we start our learning journey. And what we say at Wikimedia is it's a great place to start. It's a terrible place to finish. So, you know, we really want to encourage people to go deeper, go into the citations, really think about um, where and how knowledge is constructed and, and what does it mean to actually check those secondary and primary sources. Um, but that's like the very sort of academic answer from, you know, from my side. I, I think that we have seen a really significant shift in the ways in which educators treat Wikipedia. At this point, what we see is that most educators come to Wikipedia with an understanding that their students are using it. And then what we want to, where we want to meet them in conversation is to say, your students are using it. Let's talk about this as an opportunity to have this conversation about digital literacy or media literacy, information literacy. How can we talk to students about how Wikipedia is constructed? Maybe we can get them involved in editing Wikipedia as part of the way that they're engaging in these assignments assignments around producing knowledge. Um, we think that we see some of the educators who are really thinking about sort of the future of, of digital literacy and engaging students online um, is getting really excited about this. And so, uh, you know, I think it's a spectrum. We, we love working with folks who are really at the cutting edge of that. And we also are really happy to work with folks who are sort of saying, okay, well, I know Wikipedia is being used by my students anyway. How do we talk about where it comes from? That's uh, very admirable. Um, I guess, could you speak more to maybe some of the specific steps that Wikimedia as a foundation has taken to specifically improve public trust with perhaps people who are more reluctant or who have more reservations? I really respect people who have reservations about um, using Wikipedia. I think it comes from a, a an honorable place, which is asking this question of, having or sort of having a high respect for the integrity of information and wanting to work with resources that um, live up to those expectations. The biggest thing that has changed with Wikipedia over the course of the 20 years that we've been around is really that Wikipedia has gotten so much better. It was always a project that was trying to be as accurate as possible. And in the last two decades, we've seen such a deepened engagement with our core policies of verifiability and accuracy, a maturation of our editing community. And so when you ask about steps of trust, I would say the biggest step that we've taken is our editing community has really focused on living into the responsibility of being such a large website and being used by so many people and holding that responsibility um, in, in very high esteem. And so you'll see discussions with editors about, you know, yes, this is a breaking news event. We probably shouldn't have it on the site until we're really confident about what we know what to say, because people, this is something that you know, hundreds of millions of people might visit. And we saw this in the COVID-19 pandemic where editors were extraordinarily cautious about how they represented this novel coronavirus before we had information that we, were really confident had been sort of vetted by public health authorities. So I think most of the credit goes to the editing community themselves for, for having a very high standard or high sort of bar um, for inclusion of information. On the other side, I think, you know, as the internet has become more and more a part of our daily lives, a lot of credit goes to readers who have become increasingly savvy and adept at navigating um, sources of trust and finding ways to be able to use Wikipedia according to what their needs are. If you're looking up a pop 
star and curious what her discography, discography, yeah, that's right, discography is, um, you know, Wikipedia is going to be more or less accurate. If you're looking up questions of a politician's voting record, Wikipedia might just be a jumping off point. And I think that that's a thing that we see with readers is really they're able to like titrate up and down based on what their needs are for Wikipedia's sort of confidence in our roles for lack of a better term. Uh, I want to revisit something you touched upon, which is, you know, the strength of your editing community. So in, in 2014, Wikimedia amended its terms of use to ban any undisclosed paid editing on Wikipedia in an attempt to mitigate biased edits to the platform. How, if at all, does Wikipedia balance setting standards for its editors while also not dissuading individuals from contributing to the platform? Oh, that is such a great question. Uh, so the real, the issue in 2014 was that as Wikipedia has grown in popularity, and we were 13 years old at that point in time, we saw a lot of people trying to use Wikipedia as a PR platform. So politicians trying to whitewash um, their records. We saw companies trying to put forward, you know, their business interests in the most positive light. And this was very concerning to our editing community because they're all volunteers. And they're like, look, if we were up against an army of paid PR professionals who aren't disclosing information, it's going to be really tough for us to be able to present critical information in a light that is trustworthy to sort of combat these efforts to um, remove information that could be unflattering. And so the community agreed on this effort around banning paid editing. We called it black hat editing at the time. This idea that, you know, it's perfectly legitimate to want to correct, you know, someone's birthday, some, um, you know, the place that a person went to school, factual information. But the idea of um, manipulating a narrative without disclosing what your intentions are, or potential conflicts of interest you might have, is sort of foundationally unethical. A Wikipedia editor at the time described it to me as like, we're not the yellow pages. And and I realize it's kind of an anachronistic reference because I don't think anyone has the yellow pages anymore, but the idea is like, we're not a place for advertising, we're, we're a place for information. I don't think that dissuaded um, most general purpose editors. I think that, you know, the in fact, that actually increased the confidence that this is really meant to be a place that has a very clear purpose, which is accurate information without commercial bias or influence. Instead, I think that the biggest challenge that we see is, is that people don't necessarily automatically understand how Wikipedia works. And so I might, if I was going to edit Wikipedia as a new editor, oftentimes the first thing that I want to edit about is something that's close to me. Maybe it's the place where I work. Maybe it's the place where I grew up. Maybe it's someone I'm related to, or um, maybe it's my boss. And that's such a big no-no in Wikipedia world because that's considered a conflict of interest. And so I think for us, it really falls, the biggest issues are how do we educate the general public who want to be editors on what those basic policies are in a way that allows them to enter into editing with a really good experience while also still holding the line on things like undisclosed closed editing or black hat editing. Another issue that Wikipedia has faced in terms of editing is that a lot of its editors and contributors are largely white and largely male. How, if at all, do you believe this impacts the content that is actually published on Wikipedia? Oh, massively, Ariana. And this is where when, when you started off and, and, and spoke in such glowing terms about Wikipedia having all this information, I was like, yes, yes, it definitely does. And also there's so much that's not represented on Wikipedia today. And very often what's not represented is completely in line with the bi structural biases that we see in, in the world as a whole. So if you look around, and, and I don't think this will surprise anyone in the conversation today, um, women are underrepresented, non-binary people are un underrepresented, um, people uh, from minority communities are underrepresented, mar marginalized communities throughout history are underrepresented in the ways that we think about knowledge, in our stories of who matters in the world, in our leadership that we hold up as sort of you know archetypes of what what leadership should look like or notability should look like, or even just thinking about sort of the whole model of academic discovery or scientific discovery as sort of a lone genius type model, all of this tends to preference a um, sort of Western canonical white male bias. And what that means is that you end up with articles that are written about the history of the founding of nations um, that exclude that are written from a purely colonial lens or are written from a purely male lens or exclude um, 
um, you know, minority tribes or indigenous languages and communities. That's why I so appreciated at the beginning a partner's acknowledgement of the fact that Berkeley sits on a Ohlone land, because that is not necessarily part of the conversation that we have about the state of California in sort of general purpose knowledge. And so when we have an editor group that is narrow in its demographic. It's not necessarily that that editor group is intentionally biased. It is often more the case that they reflect a certain form of education, a certain lens in which they've been inculcated into the world, a certain prioritization of what matters or what they perceive to matter um, or have notability. And so we are very passionately committed. I'm very passionately committed to the idea that Wikipedia, if we're really thinking about all the world's knowledge, then we need to have editing communities that are representative of all the world's world's lived experiences. It's not that women edit about women and men edit about men, that that would be ridiculous. Um, we have all very diverse interests and it's more about, you know, what is your perspective? What's my perspective? What's the perspective of someone who's not in this chat today? Um, what's the perspective of someone from a different socioeconomic class, language, gender identity, and how can they bring that into Wikipedia? So a great example of this probably at least in 2010, the Wikipedia article for hero, a hero, right? The sort of archetype of some, a savior, bold, brave, courageous, was entirely male gendered. Of course there are heroes that are not male gendered, but the way that this Wikipedia article was written was all about this male gendered identity. And it wasn't until people started to really think about, you know, well, what are these implicit biases that exist within Wikipedia? How do we think about gender terms? How do we think about the ways that we reflect inclusion, different cultural narratives and experiences that we started to be able to start to write some of that out and start to try to write a more inclusive understanding of the world in. Um, so my call to all of you sitting here today on, on the chat, on the, on the live stream, um, is to really think about what role can you play in, in rewriting history um, and challenging challenging dominant narratives by being a contributor to Wikimedia. So aside from contributors themselves lending their perspectives, what other actions, if any, has Wikipedia taken to support a more equitable gender, racial, and geographical balance in terms of content and contributorship to the, uh, on the site? Yeah, absolutely. There, there are a number of different things that we have worked to do over the course of the last five years. And I'll, I'll mention a few of them. Um, one is we grant back, um, when we do our fundraisers, about eight to 10% of our annual budget goes to grant making directly to community initiatives. And that means that you can apply for a grant from the Wikimedia Foundation to work on a free knowledge project. Um, that can be, you wanna organize an event in your community, you want to have a partnership with a local institution. Uh, we have set aside funding in over the course of the last 10 years, uh, really focused on certain areas of what we call knowledge equity. So looking at representation of women, looking at representation of, um, of racial minorities, looking at representation of indigenous languages, for, for example. And just this year, we actually launched a 4.5 million for our 20th birthday, a $4.5 million equity fund, which is really focused on knowledge and racial justice, uh, looking at the ways in which free knowledge can support racial justice and looking at the ways in which racial justice needs to be part of the lens of free knowledge. So that's money is certainly one part of it, but it's not the only part. Uh, another piece of this is really thinking about the environment in which people contribute to Wikipedia. So it will come as no surprise to anyone that the internet is both a wonderful and a terrible place. And many social platforms that you participate on or I participate on uh, are often, um, there are often times in which people who speak from a minority perspective or a marginalized community perspective or just any perspective that's not part of the dominant narrative can be attacked by by trolls and, and sort of ranging to doxing and, and some really terrible behaviors that exist online. We didn't have exactly those problems at the Wikimedia projects in the same way. Um, at the scale of some other large social platforms, but we knew that participating in Wikipedia wasn't always the friendliest experience. And in fact, particularly uh, in some of our research around women's participation found that one of the biggest drivers of people 
off the Wikipedia projects was a feeling of being unwelcome. And so we launched a universal code of conduct, which really is meant to raise the floor of standards of behavior on the Wikimedia project. So everyone knows what it means to participate in a respectful manner and what it means to be welcoming of other participants. And this code of conduct lays out very specifically what harassment looks like. So people who don't have the ability to sort of run away and say, well, that wasn't harassment in my culture. No, 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 we, we're being very clear. This is what harassment looks like, and this is not acceptable. It also lays out what does it mean to have recourse if you feel as though you have been harassed, because that's another really large problem that most tech organizations face is that, okay, something's happened now, what do I do about it? How do I ensure that my rights are respected? And then I, as somebody who's experienced this, have the ability to be able to redress this, this experience. So that universal code of conduct, it's certainly something we've heard from uh, groups that are underrepresented on Wikipedia is very important, but we also know that it's actually just good for everyone. Everyone wants to work in a place in which they are respected and welcomed. And then the next thing that we're really looking at is, I've got two more things. The next thing that we're really looking at is we see that um, Editing on Wikipedia is just one way of contributing to free knowledge. There's lots of other ways to, you can be an advocate, you can be a partner, you can be a community organizer. And in these spaces, we see far greater representation of women, we see far greater representation of ethnic minorities. And so really retooling the way that we at the Wikimedia Foundation support our programs to not just look at what does editing mean, but to think about, okay, if we have community organizers that are far more gender balanced or gender representative, how can we support these groups or these individuals in doing public outreach and community building in ways that help bring in new contributors to the Wikimedia projects. And so it's rethinking what does contribution and community mean. And then I promise this is the last thing I'm going to say, but it's so important to me. Um, the last piece is if you edit Wikipedia today, you click on the edit button and you're faced with a wall of wiki text and wiki text is it's fine everyone can learn it there's no I, I don't subscribe to this idea that it's like too technical for women or it's too challenging anything like that it's just kind of a pain to have to learn something new when you're trying to just make a change or an edit to wikipedia and so we're experimenting with changes to the software that enable people to meet when they join to understand how their contributions are valued, how they can connect with a mentor or an experienced editor, how they can learn the policies and how they can find something that they care about to contribute to. Because the number one thing that we hear from people who don't participate in the sites right now is I want to, but I just don't know if it's going to make a difference. I don't know how it's going to mean something. And look, I'm a really busy person. And if I'm underrepresented in the world for whatever you know marginalized identity I might hold, I don't want to have to go in there and convince someone that my perspective matters. And so the idea here is to really start from the beginning and saying, we welcome you. We're so glad that you're here. Our software is telling you this. This experience is telling you this. We're going to connect with you, you with people who are going to reinforce this and help you learn the ropes so that you can be a valued and welcome and respected contributor in your own right from day one. Okay, that's it. Those are my four reasons. So it's it's, it's money, it's policy. Um, it's rethinking models of, of valuable contribution and it's rethinking the software so that everyone knows how they are valued from the moment they click at it. Thank you so much for an in-depth response to that question. <laughs> Sorry. No, hey, I, I this matters. <laughs> it so. does. Thank you. Um, I, I want to pivot a little bit to looking specifically at the content that Wikipedia produces. So, um, as you mentioned, large tech companies like Twitter and Facebook have faced public scrutiny for the way that they've dealt with misinformation and feed curation, especially during our past election cycles in the US. How, if at all, does the Wikimedia Foundation work to address similar issues with misinformation and its own work as a private corporation or private nonprofit? This, it, yeah, it, this is another great question. And a couple, I'm gonna try to be short, a couple of thoughts. Um, one is that the most remarkable thing about Wikipedia is that the entire model is based on good, like information that uh, with a high degree of veracity and a high degree of verifiability. So. Wikipedians take great pride in having good information on Wikipedia. And there is actually nothing that motivates a Wikipedian more than when you tell them something's wrong. They're like, oh my gosh, I have to fix it, right? So 
already we were inclined culturally from a policy perspective, from a community perspective, to have a very high bar for the quality or the integrity of information on Wikipedia. And this comes from policies like verifiability, which means you have to have citations. If you've ever seen that little citation needed badge, that's speaking to our verifiability policy. That has to go back to a reliable source. A reliable source is a source that is respected, is um, has some sort of editorial process, whether that's peer review or you know, an, an editor in sort of a traditional editorial mode, um, academic journals, press, you name it, that's what a re reliable source looks like. These policies prove to be foundational to ensuring that when an uns unsupported assertion is put on Wikipedia, it can be very quickly taken down because it doesn't go back to a reliable source. Or when in 2016, there was a big conversation around fake news, a, a site that has no credibility within the broader sector is not a reliable source. So Wikipedia's entire incentive structure is really designed around accurate information. At the foundation in these past two years, we've really focused on how do we increase information sharing with our editing community so that we understand what their needs are to be able to keep an eye on um, efforts to include disinformation in Wikipedia and how can we build software and tools that make this easier for them. And then in turn, how can we share information about what we're seeing in the broader misinformation space by having conversations with other platforms, researchers and the like, so that we can pass that along and Wikipedia editors can do the thing that they do, which is apply that extra degree of scrutiny. So it sounds like Wiki Wikipedia has a pretty self-sufficient system for how to deal with misinformation, but Comparatively, um, other sites may have a less developed infrastructure or less ability to deal with misinformation. Um, and currently the US government has little to no ability to regulate speech on um, those uh, private platforms under the First Amendment and the protections given for free speech. So what role, if any, do you believe the US government should help in playing to, or help in addressing these uh, issues with misinformation? Ooh, such a great question. Uh so a few things. Uh, I'll start by saying that I think that there are areas in which the government can and should be, has the right to regulate. So things like money and politics, for example, conversations around political advertisement and disclosure, all of that, there is a long history of um, regulata regulatory oversight and scrutiny to uh, who is paying for the information that is being presented to us. It's why you have campaign disclosures at the ends of ads, for example. That is all sort of well established. What we would, what I would say is that there is a, a an important role around regulation of platforms, of business models, of markets that support business models, for example. But that should not extend into the regulation of speech. We have a long and storied tradition of First Amendment rights in this country. And many of the ways in which we see proposals right now from a regulatory standpoint to regulate speech could be actually more problematic for platforms by creating what is often termed this idea of compulsion. So if I am being told that I have to regulate speech by providing, say, equal time to um, differing opinions, now I'm being told that I have to host speech. And the idea that a platform should have to host speech is forcing a private entity to be able to host speech that it may not agree with, that it may find despicable, that may be well outside the boundaries of the intention or purpose of the platform. So part of the reason Wikipedia works as well as it does is we're a purpose platform. We're not an expression platform. Um, you can't come on and say whatever you want about the world on Wikipedia. You can't come on and say um, that you know, uh, the world is flat. That's not accurate. And the fact that it is your personal free expression doesn't really interest us because we're here to build an encyclopedia that is based on the scientific method, that's based on research, that's based on, you know, verifiable facts. 
I think it's very important for platforms to have the ability to have their own speech rights to be able to say, I want to be a purpose platform. And another platform down the road can say, I want to be an expression platform. And I want to be able to take down the daily stormer if I so choose, because I don't want to host hate speech. That is actually all within the rights of platforms as entities. And it's one of those places where, you know, the US is a very interesting place and so much as private entities have their own sort of speech rights. This is actually a place where if you start to regulate that, I think you'll find that companies and platforms be more averse to content takedowns. And the um, space that we're in right now really enables platforms to not only be able to think about moderation, conduct, voice, speech, respect, all of these sorts of issues of, um, of how we really think through platform responsibility right now, uh, but it also enables other platforms to come along and provide alternatives, uh, which if you know a platform like Wikipedia isn't isn't providing sort of an a model that people are interested in, somebody else can come along down the road and create something new, and then it can live or thrive or die based on sort of public interest. So that's sort of a long-winded way of saying um, we. I I'm going to speak for myself. I think that it's very dangerous to start to talk about regulating speech uh, in in a country in which we place a great deal of value on people's fundamental rights. Um, but it is completely appropriate for us to think about other forms of regulation around sort of the incentive structures and business models that perhaps lead to outsized decisions around you know, um, uh, surveillance capitalism or um, a advertising markets that create some of these negative incentives that can be so problematic relative to um, uh, relative to the dissemination of, of, of problematic content online right now. All right, thank you so much for your answer. Um, unfortunately, for the sake of time, this is going to be my last question before we move oh, no. on to questions from the audience. I'm sure they're gonna be great ones, um, but I, I have to ask, since you announced recently that you'll be stepping down as CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation, um, what are your future plans and what are you excited for? Ooh, so I'm I, <laughs> I'm having conversations uh, in a couple different places right now about what the next uh, thing will be for me. So nothing that I can announce yet. Uh, one thing I'm really excited for is continuing to think about uh, what I really think of as like this right to knowledge and um, how to articulate this in a way that is shifts actually some of the conversation we were just having around like the right to speech to be really about what are the obligations that institutions have to us as citizens and individuals um, to our ability to access information, to know about what's going on in the world, to see representation, uh, to have cultural rights to information in a way that enables us to each be more informed citizens. And how might that actually allow us to live in, so in society and in community that is focused in sort of greater depth and discourse and how might that be sort of a different way of thinking about this misinformation problem? So I think much of what we talk about with misinformation is really about how do we stamp out bad information? And I'm really interested in how do we actually immerse ourselves in good information? And what are the ways in which our systems and policies and structures can focus on how they have an obligation to each of us as citizens to be able to sit within that good information and what that good information can do um, as a as sort of fertilizer nutrients for all of us to be able to be as successful as possible, um, both individually and as, as a collective community. So uh, that's what I'm really interested in thinking about. Sounds exciting. Well, thank you again so much for answering my questions. We're now going to be moving on to audience questions that we've collected over the course of this event. Um, reminder to people in the audience that if you have any further questions, you can continue to submit to the form pinned in the comments. So I think my first question is from Richard. Um, they say, loaded question, how vulnerable is Wikimedia to being quote unquote bought by powerful moneyed interests to publish content with a favorable slant to something that may be questionable? So Richard, it is a good question. And the answer is Wikipedia as an entity is not particularly vulnerable. Um, individual article pages are always a 
um, source of tension, particularly around controversial issues or issues in which, you know, there is great power interest. And so Wikipedia as an entity is, it's not even really the Wikimedia Foundation. It is all of these hundreds of thousands of volunteers who create Wikipedia around the world with their own interests, their own incentives, their own independence and integrity. And good luck corralling 300,000 Wikipedians to agree on anything, let alone sort of knuckle under sort of big power influence or big money influence, particularly that none of them get paid. It's actually the most remarkable thing. It re really just people, it gets people's backs up. They're super feisty and ind independent. Um, but on the, at the scale of the individual article, an article, say, as I said, about a corporation, a politician, this, we see often the influence, um, influence peddlers go back and forth. And the good news is, is that the most, the more popular an article is, the more scrutiny is applied to it. And so there's sort of this long tail effect where you might have an article about like, this is going to date me, but like a 1980s garage band, and no one really cares about the 1980s garage band, and maybe the information isn't quite so accurate and quite so up to date, and maybe that you know bass guitarist is no longer the guitarist. But if we're talking about a a world leader, a politician, um, a current news event, you're going to have a tremendous amount of scrutiny on that article, and that means you're going to pull in editors from all over the world and all of our political spectrums. And so sometimes we find editors who are engaged in, for example, editing on US politics, who live in very, in, in far flung locations that you would never expect, um, who don't speak English as their primary language, who are interested in this, not so much because they're interested in sort of the partisan back and forth of US politics, but because it is an area of intellectual interest from them. And so they can sort of come in and adjudicate it with a little bit of distance. And I think that that's what really makes this model work is, Jimmy Wales, our founder, has this expression about how a diamond is formed. A diamond takes a lot of carbon and compresses it under tremendous pressure to create something that is quite crystalline. Wikipedia articles, when subjected to tremendous pressure, whether that is political pressure or the pressure of public opinion, actually become their most crystalline form, uh, their highest quality form, because of all that pressure that ensures that there is that scrutiny on who is writing this, where does it come from, and where are the sources. I'm sure Richard appreciates your answer. <laughs> um, I'll move on to a question by Michael. Uh, they ask, how do you view the relationship between Wikipedia and traditional print encyclopedias, especially those that are still publishing new editions today? Um, I think that there's a model for print encyclopedias. Actually, what we've seen, or sorry, in my experience, Print encyclopedias that tend to be doing really well today actually tend to have digital and print versions, but they are often the encyclopedias that are specialist encyclopedias, which Wikipedia doesn't purport to be. We are a general purpose encyclopedia. There is certainly a space for specialized encyclopedias, and you know we want to see them succeed much in the same way we want to see anyone in the in the knowledge space succeed. Wikipedia itself is based on secondary sources, so we need a thriving media ecosystem. We need a thriving academic publishing ecosystem. We need a thriving nonfiction publishing ecosystem because without all of that, you know, what would we cite? And so. From my perspective, knowledge is a very large pie. Uh, there's a lot to go around. There is so much work to be done in thinking about how knowledge is produced, who produces it, how it's collected, the breadth of what we consider notable information. And so certainly from that regard, um, we, we, we want to support uh, both traditional encyclopedias and the broader knowledge ecosystem in any way that we can. Um, Anonymous asks, how has Wikipedia dealt with the drawbacks of being an accessible information platform, particularly one that doesn't require financial compensation like many scientific or scholarly journals? Um, I don't know what the drawbacks are, are there. I think that there are some questions about sort of labor and production online that are really important questions that Wikipedians grapple with around, um, where does, who compensates for labor and um, in the, particularly in the production of knowledge, knowledge is expensive to produce. And I want to recognize that. So scientific inquiry um, is expensive to produce. We can look at everything from various different forms of space exploration to thinking about the production of the COVID-19 vaccine. These are these are time intensive, labor intensive and capital intensive exercises. 
I think it's very important for us as Wikimedia to appreciate that and recognize that and think about how we can be complementary to the production and the preservation and the um, the deepening of knowledge in the world rather than um, rather than sitting in a position where uh, we are simply benefiting from it. And so that's where for us partnering closely with academic institutions, with libraries, with really thinking about our responsibility as a social enterprise, about being able to ensure that people have access to Wikipedia, that we're available in multiple languages, that we're really thinking about accessibility of the sites um, and an inclusive form of, um, of, uh, of accessibility. And, these are all really important things for us as we think about our role as sort of the first step into knowledge rather than rather than thinking of ourselves as sort of separate and apart from. I, I don't know if that answers your question, Anonymous, and I am sorry. Uh, I hope that it was sort of in the right direction. That's, uh, that's the best we can hope for um, <laughs> <laughs> with, with this limited interaction. Um, I have a question from Savannah. Um, they ask, what would you say to people our age, uh, i.e. people who are undergrads and in their younger 20s, who may not understand the agency they have in creating public knowledge growth through Wikipedia? I would say you have so much power and it is a very cool thing. Um, I, I'm struck, I, one of the, before we all had to, to sort of shelter in place and, and I certainly have not traveled much uh, in the last year, one of the the visits that I got to to undertake to a Wikipedia editing community that really was quite powerful to me um, was to Berzeit University, which is in the West Bank and uh, right outside of Ramallah in the Palestinian territories. And the community educators that I spoke to there talked about how editing Wikipedia in their classes as part of the pedagogical approach, teaching people how to edit Wikipedia in Arabic was a form of both contributing to public information available in the Arabic language, but was also sometimes the first time their students had the opportunity to, to experience what it meant for their knowledge to have value. It was more than writing an essay for class. It was more than putting something on a teacher's desk that would go ultimately into a trash can. It was a way of using their intellect, their research capacity, their dedication, their tenacity to put something into the world that would mean something for somebody else. And particularly in the context of this community, this is not something that many of these students had previously had the opportunity to do in their education. Many hopefully will go on to have that opportunity in their professional careers and in their lives. But the whole point of education often is transformation and the ability to understand the capacity you have as an individual. I think that everybody listening today and, and frankly, everyone in the world has something to add to knowledge. And that could be something entirely new that we've not seen before. And it could also be a reinterrogation of something that we've assumed. And so I would say to you, if you want to start by editing Wikipedia, that is a great place to start. Um, there is so much work to be done. There's an editor who has an estimate about all the notable things in the world, every town, every major piece of art, um, every notable individual who's ever lived. And there are 6 million articles on English Wikipedia. This editor estimates that there's probably 120 million notable things in the world. So if you think that everything out there has been written, I am here to tell you that is certainly not true. Only 2% of the content that is geotagged on Wikipedia is about the African continent. Only 18% of the biographies on English Wikipedia are about women. There is so much work to be done to write history, to write our society, to think about how we represent the world. And believe me, we need you contributing to it. So thank you for the question, <laughs> Savannah. I really appreciate it. All right, one last question before I turn it back. Um, what is your favorite Wikipedia article? <laughs> um, so I've sold this story a few times and apologies if anyone's heard it before. My favorite Wikipedia article is the overview effect. Uh, the overview effect is something that astronauts describe when they go into space and they look back at the earth and they see the earth as fragile as it is against this vast inky darkness. So people often call it like, you know, the blue dot or the marble. Think of how small a dot is. Think of how small a marble is. That is the 
effect that being in space has on an individual is to see how fragile the earth is and had to see it suspended in essentially this, this great nothingness really emphasizes that this is our home. And there are no borders when you look at the earth from the International Space Station or from the moon. You can't see the things that separate us. You can only see what connects us, which is this earth that we share, this globe that we share. And so the overview effect describes the fact that astronauts come back to earth and they're like <laughs> oh my goodness i this is something that is tremendous and fragile and special and humanity must think about ourselves as a united whole and this earth as our spaceship you've probably heard that before um that requires our care and our stewardship i love this because i think it speaks to so much of the values of wikipedia which is knowledge is something that we do as humanity knowledge is something that we share across languages cultures and centuries it is something that connects us not something that divides us and all all of us are able to build on knowledge from community to community across time and across space in a way that enables and enriches us as humanity. The other thing that I really like about the overview effect is it's actually a really bad, not bad, it's not a great article. It's not it's not deeply cited, it's not deeply researched. And I love that because it shows you that even something that is imperfect can still have real value. And so I keep saying that, hoping that at some point I'm gonna go back and check the overview effect and it's gonna be an amazing article. But right now it is just an okay article. And that has a certain sort of power too. It, it's a, Sometimes it's enough to be okay or good enough. You can still inspire and you can still mean something in the world. So I both love it at like this meta level and I also love it at this textual level. Um, anyway, if anyone wants to improve the overview effect, I, I would I, that would mean a lot to me. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have today. Thank you again for answering our questions. At this point, I'd like to welcome our president, Aparna Iyer, back up to the stage for some closing remarks. Thank you, and a huge virtual round of applause to Oriana, our moderator for the evening, and to Catherine Marr, our incredible speaker. I really appreciated that. And in fact, as a token of our appreciation, um, at every single Berkeley Forum event, our communications team designs a custom poster for our speaker, and this event is no exception. Um, so this was designed by Ashna Desai on our communications team, and we hope you like it. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Ashna. That is very cool. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Yes, I do. I do so much. Um, We're glad. Really and yeah, special. actually at this point, if you do have any last closing remarks, anything you'd like to say before we close out, feel free. I am just very grateful for the opportunity to spend time with you all here today. Um, as I said, I, I am stepping down from the Wikimedia Foundation in large part because I I do believe very deeply in this idea that Wikipedia is something that we share together. It is something that we steward together and it is important for that to be a regenerative role to lead uh, this organization and to really think about where knowledge comes from. And so I'm very hopeful that one thing that maybe comes out of this for you today and being here is really thinking about what role you can play. Um, there's one of my colleagues like to say, Wikipedia is a thing we do together. Free knowledge is a thing we do together. I, I'm actually a really big believer that even when you read Wikipedia, what you're doing is you're vouching for how important free knowledge is in the world. You're, you're um, committing to this idea of education and inquiry and learning as something that has value. And so I just ask you to keep being curious. Um, that was that would be where I would leave it. Thanks so much for sharing that. We're incredibly lucky to have you here. And um, I'd really quickly just like to recognize everyone who worked on this event from the Berkeley Forums team. Uh, they put together an awesome event. So really thankful for them. And to our audience, we do have more Berkeley Forum events coming up this semester. Um, on the 17th of March, we'll be, we will be hosting Sung Min Kim, a White House correspondent for the Washington Post. And thank you so much for spending your evening at the Berkeley Forum. Uh, we encourage you to fill out our feedback form uh, to suggest any speakers or improvements to our events at tinyurl.com slash forum feedback spring 21. And to keep up with what we're doing, you can feel free to like us on Facebook or visit our website at forum.berkeley.edu. Lastly, if you are willing and able, we do ask that you help support us. Our Venmo is linked below and any amount goes toward helping us put on more events. Once again, thank you for spending your evening at the Berkeley Forum, and we hope to see you at another event soon.